grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel of St. Matthew, the 25th chapter where Jesus speaks to us, will serve as our sermon meditation this morning. Beginning at verse 31, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. These are the words of our text. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, once again, sheep and goat are the central focus of the metaphors that Jesus is using to depict the great day called Judgment Day. There are similarities between the two. If we were to look upon sheep and goats grazing in a pasture field, we would have a hard time detecting these little animals. They're about the same size, floppy ears, little snout. Four legs. But they have many more dislikes than they do similarities. Aside from the fact that one has a fleece and one has hair, sheep are very shy. Goats are very brash. Sheep don't like danger. They run from it. If that's what you call what sheep do. Goats stick around for a fight. Sheep are interdependent on each other in groups. They like to be with groups, and they also are dependent on a shepherd. Not so much with goats. Goats are actually more intelligent than sheep, and far more independent than they are sheep. Is it any wonder that Jesus takes this strikingly eerie comparison between these two animals and says, this is what humanity looks like? You and I might look out and see, oh, that's a person. What does God see? He sees either a have or a have not. Someone either going to heaven or going to spend their eternity in the kingdom of hell. That's what he sees. But we have a hard time. We have a hard time because the Bible even says that there are going to be people in the church. But the great difference is only going to be this. On the judgment of it all, there's either faith or unbelief. And that will be the final verdict of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell for all eternity? Faith. Interesting, isn't it, that Jesus says both the sheep and the goat, both the believer and unbeliever, are going to offer up the same exact protest to Jesus? Both of them are going to say, Lord, when in the world did we see you that way? But one question is going to be driven from faith. The other one's going to be driven from unbelief. You guys remember Jesse Ventura? All-star wrestler, governor of the great state of Minnesota. 
independent governor. He was a self-proclaimed goat. This is what Jesse Ventura had to say about organized religion. He says it's a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. Listen to what he said. They need strength in numbers. Goats don't need strength in numbers. They're independent. They're self-made men and women. They have their own minds, they can think for themselves, and they're gonna count on their own intellectual brilliance or merits to get them where they want to go when they die. And boy, are they going to be sorely mistaken when they die. Sheep, however, very, very dependent on each other. Don't always think it, but we really are. And Jesse Ventura, a self-proclaimed goat, he even understood that we need to find strength in numbers. You remember when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of thee? Kind of an unusual expression. Because it's not as though he's not with you and you're alone. It's not that you can hide in some secret place and Jesus isn't there. When Jesus says where two or three are gathered together, he's talking about the sacred intimacy of the church. You see, in Old Testament law, God did not allow an accuser to accuse someone without a corroboration of witnesses. There had to be a testimony of two or three in order to corroborate the crime. Well, Jesus says where two or three witnesses of me and what I have done for them, when they come together, there is a sacred union between the shepherd and the sheep. Right now we meet the quota and then some, don't we? Where two or three come together, Jesus is there blessing his flock in a very intimate and sacred way. We need each other. We can't go it alone. And yet sadly sometimes Sheep even think they can go it alone. Don't be a goat. More and more we're finding today that people are abandoning the church, abandoning the shepherds, not looking for spiritual instruction. They got it all when they were in Sunday school. They got it all when they were confirmed. They don't need any more. Jesus reminded his church when he sent them out it would be this way. And he said, look, if they don't listen to you, they aren't listening to me. And if they aren't listening to me, then they're rejecting the one who sent me. Be careful where you send your kids to school. If you're going to send them to a pool full of goats, then make sure you take care of their spiritual instruction. If you're sending your kids off to college, take them to that college and go meet their shepherd at that church and say, here is your shepherd. Here is going to be other college students that you should make yourself be around because you need that encouragement. Have you gone with your daughter or son to that college and found that shepherd? I had a big campus ministry in Duluth, Minnesota, serving four different colleges. And guess what? Those parents that took their kids to college and introduced them to their shepherd for that four years tended to come. They found a ride. We had rides for them. But guess what? Those parents that didn't do it, they weren't ever found. We had over 100 college students from the wells in the area. And we would get somewhere between 16 to 22 per year that we would work with. What happened to the other 80? They're congregating with goats. You absolutely need each other. Tell your children to find a Christian spouse. Half of marital problems would be gone if they found someone that was like-minded in their faith, that shared the same values and the same Lord and same Savior. Then how often don't couples get together and say, well, we'll figure out our spiritual world after we get married, and what a disaster that often is. Jesse Ventura was right. It is a crutch for the weak. Because sheep are weak. And we do find our strength in numbers. And we are dependent on each other. The church. There's a fine line, dear friends, between believer and unbeliever. For just as we cannot tell the difference when they're grazing together... So it is that we cannot tell the difference when we look into an assembly called the church. Jesus said as much, didn't he? 
He said the weeds and the wheat will grow together until the day of harvest, and then he will take care of the separating at the end. He said the sheep and the goats still graze together until the end, and he will sift through them, and he will determine who are the haves and the have-nots, those who have faith and those who do not. On one occasion during Jesus' ministry, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee because the crowds wanted to turn him into their bread king. And he went away to a remote place to pray to his Father in heaven. He walked on water. You remember that account? In the middle of the night, they get to the other side. It's the next day. And the crowds caught up to Jesus and his disciples. And the Jewish people asked Jesus a very specific and pointed question. They said, tell us, what are the works that God requires of us to get into heaven? It was the wrong question to ask. But Jesus answered it. He told them in John's gospel, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. In other words, to put your faith in what God has given to you, a good shepherd. But remember, goats don't need a good shepherd. They don't need any shepherd. They don't need the Bible. They don't need instruction. They don't need spiritual advice. They're self-made men and women. Which is why Jesus had to go on and say, stop working for food that spoils. Work for food that endures until everlasting life. You guys are working for the wrong things in this world. You're putting your stock in the wrong things. There's only one thing needful. And Jesus was saying, it's me. Nothing else. The reason believers offer the same protest as the unbeliever on the last day, Lord, when did we even see you this way? It's because nothing they did was driven with the attitude that they were earning anything from God. That's not why you come to church, is it? It's not why you give offerings, is it? It's not why you open your Bibles at home, is it? It's not why you pray to God, is it? It's not why you take an active interest in people who are hurting, people who are in prison, people who are sick, people who are mentally deranged, people who are living in a world of unbelief. It's not really why you go and share God's love with the people of this world, is it? Because somehow you think a feather is going to be put in your cap and somehow it'll make Judgment Day a little more tolerant when God has to look at you and review you? No. You do it. I pray you do it. I pray we all do it because we have come to understand by faith that something great, something incredible has happened to us. And you know what that greatness is, don't you? God died for you. God condescended and took on human flesh and became your sin. And you know that, not just like a head knowledge of this man died on the cross, but you are intimately acquainted with, by faith, that somebody exchanged his life for yours to make you what you are not so that you could become what he is, righteous and holy. Jesus said as much. He said, look, I know my sheep. I call them by name. I know the hairs on their head, whether they're few or many. And he says, my sheep know me. We know where to find the good shepherd's voice, don't we? We know where he dispenses grace from his altar, don't we? And that is the great difference on Judgment Day, is that this relationship will be manifested to the whole world. You see, it's not about being self-pious or self-righteous or better than the other person. If that were the case, that sheep dying next to Jesus wouldn't be in heaven, would he? Faith is what saved him. And faith is what saves you and me from eternal damnation. Sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes it's easy as we go through this life to forget why we exist even as a church, a body of believers. 
I think sin can kind of convolute the whole thought process a bit, can it? And isn't it true that we can have a hundred compliments and three or four people speaking negatively about us and what is it that you and I retain? We forget all about the positive, don't we? We just think about those things that people are saying about us. And we forget why we exist here. About six years ago, I was serving on a little children's board, Camp Croy. It's like our Camp Philip here in central Wisconsin. And, and the board was tired. They didn't have the resources they once had. The camp was getting overgrown. There were lots of dilapidated buildings. And people were exasperated. Even churches weren't sponsoring it the way they once did. And about six months into my work there, one of the board members, his name was Colin, he called me up. He had been a board member for 18 years. He was about my age. He had been serving since he just got out of college. And he was one of the most exasperated ones. And he called me up and he said, you're not going to believe it. This woman said I saved her daughter's life. And I said, well, what did she have to say? He's like, well, it's crazy because I know I never helped anyone if they were dr Nobody was drowning at the camp. Nobody was ever... He's like, what do you mean? I saved your daughter's life. And, and she said, well, my daughter had you as her camp counselor when she was a kid. She went off to high school, went to college, and she was sadly mistreated by a boy. And so she thought about ending it all. She would cry herself to sleep at night and um, didn't know who to talk to about what had happened to her. And um, on her windowsill in her dorm room, this would later come out when she would seek help and see a counselor, was this white ivory cross that she made in a kid's camp. And she would take that cross and she'd hold on to it and put it close to her chest when she'd go to bed at night and she would, she would weep asking God to have mercy on her, to relieve her of her pain. This board member, Colin, this woman called him to thank him because it was part of the recovery and the therapy that she believed helped save her life. And he was almost apologetic to me on the phone because he had expressed so much exasperation of being a board member. You see, he forgot why he was doing what he was doing in the first place. Because the daily grind, even of church work, can, we can lose sight of the fact that we exist, dear friends, as Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians, we exist to encourage each other about the gospel. What did Jesus say is going to happen on the end of time? He said, we as sheep are going to say, Lord, when did I ever even see you as that girl? When did I see you as that person that was crying her, her, her night to sleep contemplating. When did I ever see you like this, Lord? The sheep are going to have no idea about the hearts whom they touched with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if we forget about what the gospel has done for us, we'll forget exactly why we exist as Christians. Because just as fast as God brought us here as a church, he could take that away, can't he? Didn't Luther say that the gospel is like a rain shower? When it rains and pours, the place blossoms and grows. But when it's eventually rejected, what happens to that rain cloud? Does it stick down and keep raining? No. It moves on to another place, doesn't it? Look what's happening to our country today. When's going to be the next shooting? When's going to be the next time someone gets run over by a van? The Bible said the love of many will grow cold, and it is growing cold. This is the new world that our kids and our grandkids are growing up in. They are going to see this as everyday part of their lives because we as a society have systematically kicked our Savior out of it. And we are reaping the consequences of what we as a nation have done, what we as a church have done. Have you lost your way? Do you know why you're here this morning? Do you know why we exist as a church? What is our goal? It's simple. To be encouraged by the very gospel that saved us from eternal death. And then to take that gospel outside of these walls 
and share it with all of God's people unapologetically until the time called the end comes upon us. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Jesus.